Wasabi Wallet. I'm fairly private. What's up, everyone? Ben with the BTC Sessions here, and this is your daily session. Hodl that Bitcoin. Before we jump in, of course, shout out to sponsors of the show, Ledin.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin for a few different services, uh, one of which is a Bitcoin savings account where you can earn more Bitcoin on top of your Bitcoin paid in Bitcoin. You can also get a Bitcoin back loan. This is where you use your Bitcoin as collateral to get a Canadian or US dollar loan into your bank account. Um, and that sits in a dedicated account that you can audit at all times. So if you're looking to get your hands on dollars, but you're worried about selling Bitcoin because you think it might be a bad time, well, this could be an option for you. And finally, if you're a huge Bitcoin bull and you think moving forward there could be some price appreciation, you can check out their B2X option. That's where you can double your exposure to Bitcoin. And set, oh, I should also mention off, uh, if you opt to get one of these loans, uh, the link that you use below, uh, if you click it, they will credit your account with an additional $50 worth of Bitcoin, assuming that you get one of those loans. And also, if you're into Bitcoin, then of course, privacy is important. And one of the things I use all the time on my phone, on my computer is NordVPN. So this hides your IP address, so you don't leak your location. And it also encrypts your browsing data. On top of that, it has some other added benefits. And one of my favorite things is being able to unlock geoblock content. So if there's something that you can't access in your country and you need to essentially pretend to be somewhere else, well, NordVPN allows you to do that and bang, all of a sudden that content is unlocked. So if you want to check that out, there is a link down below in the description and that'll get you 70% off. It ends up being about $3.49 a month. So pretty solid there. And with that, let's dive into the news. Everybody panic. Bitcoin is crashing. What do you do? Everybody's freaking out. China's banning everything, apparently. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the news. And let's take a look at historically kind of how things have played out. So anyways, uh, this is from Reuters, uh, Reuters, and it's titled Bitcoin plummets to a six month low on China crackdown. Uh, so I'm just going to read a little bit of this. It says Bitcoin slumped to a six month low on Friday after China's central bank launched a fresh crackdown on cryptocurrencies, warning of the risks entailed in issuing or trading them. Uh, the People's Bank of China, Shanghai ch headquarters, said that it would tackle growing cases of illegality involving virtual currencies. It also cautioned investors not to confuse crypto with blockchain technology, the digital ledger that underpins many cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Um, so this is as they're looking to launch their own digital currency, a, a, uh, a digital version of the Chinese yuan or renminbi. Uh, so we did see a price appreciation when uh, um, recently the president of China came out and seemed to be very pro blockchain and people assumed that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies were grouped in with that. Well, obviously that is not the case, which should be a surprise to nobody given that China likes to have control of everything. They're notorious for um, any dissenters. They just shut them down digitally and cut them off from the world. Uh, so this really should not come as a shock. Now, if we go over to Coin Telegraph here again, uh, we have a headline that says Bitcoin drops to seven thousand dollars and below um, as China vows to dispose of local exchanges. So a little bit here. Um, Cryptocurrency exchanges operating illegally in China face a th new threat after the central bank announced it would take new steps to uphold its trading ban. In a statement on November 21st, the People's Bank of China warned it would take action against entities allegedly involved in trading cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Um, the move was in response to a rise in trading activity following China's public endorsement of blockchain technology. It said once it is discovered, it will be disposed of immediately and it will per be prevented from happening early. Um, so essentially they're saying, hey, if we find uh, illegal tra trading platforms within the country, we're going to go and shut them down. 
so in response to this, you obviously have people like, once again, Peter Schiff saying that, uh, you know, Bitcoin is is inevitably going to go to $1,000. He thinks that it'll hit that and maybe bounce off of it before eventually going to zero, as he always assumes. But that's in his best interest uh, to think that way because his business entirely hinges on gold being like the sole store of value for the world and that a digital alternative would just kind of throw that into disarray. Um, Now, after all of this, we have uh, some some people refuting this. Um, So Bithum out of Bithum out of South Korea uh, says that the rumors of their offices being closed or raided are are completely fabricated. So they said the um, and they said that that uh, recent rumors of police raid and closure in the Shanghai office uh, are false, and that it's only uh, it's one and only Shanghai team continues to operate steadily without pause. This is also. After uh, this is also after Binance was reportedly had their Shanghai offices reportedly raided. However, turns out they don't even have a Shanghai office. So they said a Binance team, uh, the Binance team is a global movement consisting of people working in a decentralized manner wherever they are in the world. Binance has no fixed offices in Shanghai or China. So it makes no sense that police raided on any offices and shut them down. Um, We encourage our friends in the media to verify its sources um, that are telling them the truth or that its sources are indeed telling them the truth or presenting their own agenda. Uh, So it seems that there's there's some back and forth of whether this is actually happening. Um, So is this actually the death of Bitcoin or is it? Uh, just another day in the markets. Is this par for the course? Well, I guess we can kind of start to look historically and see what how markets have reacted to this kind of stuff in the past. Now, um, this was a great quote from uh, Stephen Cole. Uh, if you're not following him on Twitter, you should check him out. But anyways, he said he's quoting a bunch of kind of Bitcoin obituaries of when Bitcoin has supposedly died. So so that's the end for Bitcoin then. That was a title from Forbes in 2011. Bitcoin headed to the ash heap USA Today in 2015. RIP Bitcoin, time to move on. Uh, 2016, stay away from Bitcoin, it's garbage. Market watch in 2017. Is Bitcoin going to zero? Forbes in 2018. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of people calling for the death of Bitcoin. Uh And further to that, let's take a look at this. Look at this. China's Bitcoin crackdown intensifies as two more platforms are closed. Oh, wait. This was in May 8th of 2014. Moving on. Fake China Bitcoin ban pushes BTC price below $600. $600? What? Oh, wait. This was from March 21st of 2014. Um, China's Bitcoin banking ban. Uh, oh, wait, this is December 5th of 2013. <laughs> uh, here's a bunch from, from Jan Pritzker, author of Inventing Bitcoin. Um, and here's a, a bunch of fun articles. Bitcoin in China, the fallout from Chinese government banning real world use. December 6th, 2013. China crackdown sends Bitcoin sliding. January 12th of 2017. China brags its cryptocurrency ban has practically killed local Bitcoin trading. Jan- July 9th of 2018. The headlines are riddled with old stories of China banning Bitcoin. Bitcoin taking a hit in price and then realizing that these bans are either made up or unenforceable. And it continues to happen again and again. It will continue to happen more and more. Now, some people may point to this and say it doesn't matter if the story is real. It's going to have real impact on Bitcoin because miners are going to be forced out from lower prices, from manipulation in the markets and uh fake news. However, um, we need to look back and understand how Bitcoin mining actually works. So the reason for the FUD here 
is that people say, well, beyond a certain point, Bitcoin is no longer profitable to mine and miners will continue dropping out until there's no security to the network. In turn, Bitcoin will have failed and anybody can just attack the network easily. But how does that actually work? So as the Bitcoin price drops, uh, yes, miners need to sell more of their mining rewards in order to cover their costs. That is true. Um, so as the price drops, then what you see typically is some of the miners that are the least efficient, the ones that have the most expensive power, um, that it costs them the most to keep the equipment on and running, that, that don't have any subsidies or don't have renewable energy, things like that, they drop out. They do indeed shut off their machines. But how does the Bitcoin network actually react to that? Well, when you turn off mining machines, there is a drop in the hash rate. And the difficulty of mining Bitcoin stays the same for a set, a targeted number of blocks, 2000 and, oh God, 2000, 2016 blocks. I'm, I'm kicking myself for not knowing exactly. Normally, when the same amount of hashing power after an adjustment um, is pretty equalized, it should take about two weeks before the Bitcoin difficulty retargets. And what it does is it looks at, did a Bitcoin block come roughly every 10 minutes? If it took longer for miners to mine, as in there weren't enough miners guessing in order to uh, get a new Bitcoin block roughly every 10 minutes, well, that means that the difficulty of mining Bitcoin will actually drop after that uh, after that two week, or it'll be slightly longer than two weeks in that instance, uh, after that readjustment period. So it'll look and say, hey, we didn't have enough miners on the network. Um, Clearly, there, there weren't enough incentives to get people to mine. So we're going to drop the difficulty, make it a little bit easier for people to successfully mine Bitcoin. And that then incentivizes the miners that were able to stick it out to stay there. And it makes it once again profitable for them. So what's the worst case scenario? Well, let's say we had a, all of a sudden 50% of all miners in a given period dropped out because it wasn't cost effective. Like right at the beginning of the readjustment period, they said, uh, we're going to shut off all our machines, which is probably not going to happen because a lot of those costs are sunk in the first place anyways. Well, at the end of that period, it would take roughly double the amount of time. So instead of two weeks, you would have four weeks where Bitcoin was just slow, where instead of every 10 minutes, you would have every 20 minutes, there would be a block, roughly. And at the end of that, the network would look and say, wow, it's taking double the amount of time. We need to cut the difficulty by half. And all of a sudden, Bitcoin goes back to chugging along at 10 minutes per block with the same reward for the miners um, that they were used to prior. So Bitcoin was designed to readjust for these fluctuations over time. And if anything, we might see a dip in hash rate because inefficient miners get pushed out and then only the most efficient, most competitive miners will be there um, for when the price appreciates eventually again. So, um, so let's take a look at one other site. If you're really kind of worried and freaking out, then take a look at bitcoinobituaries.com. Uh, this is over at 99bitcoins.com. But if you type in Bitcoin obituaries, this will be the first thing. And it's all these fun articles historically about why <laughs> about why Bitcoin has died, um, all of which have been untrue. So they've got this great graphic here of here lives Bitcoin 2009 to and then each year crossed out that it has not died. Uh, there's a lot of them. They have about 377 articles here. I definitely know there's been more than that. But if you see others, you can actually submit them down below. Um, and one last thing, let's take a look historically what happened. So I zoomed in on the chart here of the previous Bitcoin bull and bear market. So this was uh, the peak in t the end of 2013, all the way through its bear market until it eventually returned to its previous all time high before going on to the crazy market of 2017. And, and we need to remember that, that this was a long drawn out bear market. Like it went from, again, the end of 2013 
to the new peak at the end of 2017, a four-year cycle, which very much mirrors the four-year cycle of the halving, um, except for it does take a little while after the halving to, I guess, create that FOMO, that pinch, that squeeze where people can't get their hands on as much Bitcoin as they're used to, and it, it creates a bit of a mania. Well, let's just take a look historically in terms of time where we're at now. Well, we are at the end of 2019, which is about two years after the all-time high, roughly. So the previous all-time high was the end of 2013. So if we go over to the end of 2015, well, we're, we're sitting in and around here. Now, obviously, it's been a little bit different this time around. Actually, Bitcoin rebounded a little bit faster than previously. So we, we again, to contextually, we've actually had a way easier bear market this time around than the previous one. Um, just for context here, so the all-time high uh, in 2013 was uh, pretty close to 1,200 bucks. So. Um, it finally dropped below like half of that con like concisely and didn't come back above it for quite some time in and around uh, July of 2014. So like six or seven months after it remained decisively less than half of its previous all time high for a solid two years. So it didn't even get close uh, it didn't even rise above halfway of its previous all-time high for, for basically two years. So like June of 2016. So yeah, so two years of not even getting to halfway, half of the previous all-time high. Um, we've already been above that level decisively. We went to like 13K and the previous all-time high was 19 something, getting close to 20. Um, so it... It was, it took until about, yeah, it was right around the halving. So the halving was in, uh, was in and around mid to late July of 2016. And there was like a decisive rise just before that, like a little bit of a, uh, buy, buy the rumor and sell the news kind of thing, but it didn't stay decisively above half of its previous all time high until actually a couple months after the halving. Uh, and then that's when it started to go back up towards its previous all-time highs. And it didn't really stay above those previous all-time highs until the first couple months of 2017. Now, if we jump to where we're at now, here's the previous all-time high at the end of mid-December. So December 17th of 2017, so we did go above the previous all-time high, uh, sorry, halfway above the previous all-time high in and around uh, June of this year when we had that big peak. Um, and we stayed above it for a little bit, peak below it, but obviously we're down, you know, or we're, we went below seven earlier today. Well, I mean, look at this bear market. Like it's, realistically it's like nothing uh i'm gonna count this as like about half of the previous all-time high so what do we have may of 2018 we went back above it uh june of 2019 so really we had like a year of that um but again if contextually historically if we were to look back um if we were to experience the same bear market as last time, we wouldn't have even seen the prices that we saw kind of throughout the summer and prior to the summer until next year in June, July, August, September. We wouldn't have even seen a decisive rise above 10K until next fall. So try to keep that in context when you're freaking out about the price right now. And remember, when you're looking at the chart of Bitcoin uh, historically, once again, this is zoomed out. This is what 2015 and 2016 looks like in the context of what happened in the last couple of years. And I'm pretty confident that in a few years, 
these dips and these crazy movements that we're seeing right now will be as indecipherable as the crazy moves that happened in 2015 and 2016 and the misery that people experienced there will barely be visible. Um, So, you know, keep a cool head about you. Relax. It's going to be fine. I mean, if you've been around since that bear market, then you're probably just the whole world is dead to you anyways. <laughs> you're just completely jaded. But if you're new here, if you've only been around for a couple of years, so you've only ever seen the all time highs and then the depths of the bear market this time around, just know that the people that have stuck it out have seen similar things and they're still here. And, uh, and also, you know, what's changed? Is Bitcoin broken in any way? Is Bitcoin any less of a utility than it was in, say, June of this year when we pumped up to $13,000? If in your head the answer is no and fundamentally nothing has changed, then just, just keep that in mind uh, as you're making decisions. And if you're freaking out and you don't know what to do, that may be indicative of the fact that you didn't plan in the first place. You didn't say what will I do in situations where the price fluctuates? Um, And you need to think about that well in advance of crazy fluctuations. Make a plan for yourself. Do you just want to continue to dollar cost average through stuff like that? It helps take out some of the emotion, something to think about. Also, think future, like is there a certain price point where you want to actually take profits, where you want to actually... You know, enjoy some of the money that you've made if it continue if it goes back up. Um, and what about if it dips below a certain point? You need to think of these things in advance so that you don't make emotional decisions, so that everything is laid out in front of you before you get to that point. Because it's times like this in the market where people get irrational and emotional and make make bad calls. So that is my bit of advice. Uh, Let me know how you're doing in these crazy wild fluctuations or if the world is just dead to you. (laughs) Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I just wanted to offer a little bit of like a a step back from, from the panic of Bitcoin Twitter right now and and present kind of a calm, cool present, uh, you know, line of thinking. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you in the comments and I'm sure I've been chatting you all up in the chat during this as well. Uh, Anyways, if you want to help out the show, of course, uh, always like, subscribe and share. Hit that share button. Um, Great to have new people here. If you want to help out the show in another way, you can hit up the sponsors, Ledin and Nord. Links to those are in the in the show notes down below. And also check out Wasabi Wallet. It's great for privacy. It's always good to break links between you and your Bitcoin so that any prying eyes does not get any, any insight into your financial dealings. It's it's nice to keep that separate. Uh, and finally, if you really like what you saw, you can check out and send over a Bitcoin Lightning Network tip at my tippin.me page. And with that, I am out. Have a wonderful evening, a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday for your daily session.